Welcome, welcome everybody. And uh, this is the uh, another yet another seminar of the AIM series on artificial intelligence and mathematics. Today we are very happy to have with us uh, Carola Bibiane Schenlib. Uh, Carola is a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Cambridge. There she is the head of the Cambridge Image Analysis Group and co-director of the EPS, EPSRC Cambridge Mathematics of of Information Healthcare Hub. Since 2011, she's a fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge, and since 2016, a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute in London. She also holds the chair of the Committee for Application and Interdisciplinary Relations of the EMS. Her current research interests focus on variational methods, partial differential equations, and machine learning for image analysis image processing and inverse imaging problems. She has active interdisciplinary collaborations with clinicians, biologists, and phys physicists on, on biomedical imaging topics, chemical engineers, and plant scientists on image sensing, as well as collaboration with artists and art conservators on digital art restoration. Her research has been acknowledged by scientific prizes, among them the LMS Whitehead Prize in 2016, the Philip Leverhul Prize in 2017, the Calderon Prize in 2019, a Royal Society Wolfson uh, Fellowship in 2020, a doctorate honoris causa from the University of Klagenfurt in 2022, and by invitations to give plenary lectures at several renewed applied mathematics conferences, among them the SIAM Conference on Imaging Imaging Science in 2014, the SIM Conference on Partial Differential Equations in 2015, the SIM Annual Meeting in 2017, the Applied Inverse Problems Conference in 2019, the FOCM 2020, and GAMM 2021. Okay, it's a pleasure again to have with us uh, Carola. Uh, please, I leave the floor to her. Please go on. Thank you so much, Flavio, for the really kind introduction. Uh, thank you uh, also to Italia and Flavio for inviting me uh, to give this uh, talk to you today. Thank you so much. So, um, what am I going to do in this uh, roughly uh, one hour uh, presentation? I want to introduce you to the, in my opinion, fascinating topic of AI and imaging, or uh, how I like to term it, um, mathematical imaging. And in particular, I want to um, tell you what kind of problems we are solving in mathematical imaging, why we want to solve them, and how. And so this is really going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour through uh, various topics uh, within mathematical imaging. Uh, and I, in particular, I want to give you a flavor of the kind of methodologies that we are developing in mathematical imaging right now and what the perspectives are for the future. And of course, uh, as in many areas of mathematics, um, deep learning, machine learning is having a huge impact on how we do things. And um, so that uh, you will also see in my talk. I have lots of slides. If I don't get to the end, it's not an issue at all. I just need to keep track of time or, you know, Flavio and Italia might want to stop me at some point. Okay. So, um, since this is a talk on uh, AI and mathematics, I think the best way to start explaining what mathematical imaging is, is with a definition. Huh? And so let me, let me uh, spell out the definition, mathematical imaging, is the study and development of mathematical methods for image analysis, image processing, and inverse problems in imaging. Yeah? And to get us a little bit into the mood, what mathematical imaging is about and what it can do, I want to uh, watch with you a video. And I hope this is going to work now because I've not used this uh, system here before, but uh, we'll see in a moment. I hope you can now see this. Hey, Carola. Hi, Samu. Hey. You know how to remove things from photographs, right? That's right. Uh, can we try? Sure. Can you make the code disappear? Okay. Watch it. 
Oh, right. Pretty good. I think I can still see something. Yeah, that was harmonic in painting. Okay. We can try total variation in painting. All right. Okay. Oh, pretty cool. Ah, isn't it? All right. Can we try some more stuff? Yeah, that would be fun. All right. Let's, Let's do it. Try it. <laughs> Uh, smiling myself when I'm watching this because it was a really a lot of fun to to actually produce it. So, all right, good. Um, yeah, so that's the first flavor. But uh, let's uh, let's uh, go uh, a little bit more general. So, telling you a little bit about myself, uh, Flavio already mentioned. Um, I have a, gr a research group uh, here in Cambridge in the applied math department called uh, Cambridge Image Analysis Group. And uh, this is really a group of uh, mathematicians, um, you know, PhD students and postdocs who are doing great work uh, in uh, developing mathematical methods uh, for, uh, for imaging problems. And uh, I really want to thank them at this point uh, for all the wonderful things that they do and that you will see in this presentation. Um, so what do we do? Uh, you know, I'm trying to be very broad at the beginning and then I'll give you a bit more details as we go on. So we develop mathematical methods based on partial differential equations. So now you see already some of the mathematical topics that appear in this uh, area of mathematical imaging. So partial differential equations, variational models, optimization and machine learning. Uh, to solve um, a relatively wide range of um, inverse imaging, image analysis, and image processing tasks, ranging from image reconstruction from indirect measurements, such as they appear, uh, for instance, in computer tomography, uh, where we are not measuring an image directly, where, but where there is a process involved to actually be able to see an image from the measurements. Uh, image restoration, so image denoising, deconvolution, deblurring, things like this. Um, image segmentation and classification, sorry about that. Image segmentation and classification, uh, all the way to also analyzing and processing uh, dynamic uh, imaging data, so video data, and there we do motion estimation and object tracking. So all this uh, theory and method uh, development that we do on these um, models that we develop for solving these tasks uh, is usually uh, linked uh, very tightly to uh, real world applications. And um, since images are in lots of different places, also the re these real world applications are quite diverse. So they range from photography to remote sensing, biomedical imaging, arts restoration, forensics, material sciences, plant sciences, and so on and so forth. Yeah? 
So this should just give you a little bit of a context of where I'm coming from and why I guess I'm presenting what I'm uh, presenting to you today. Okay, so what I want to do in this talk is exactly to go through this uh, what, why, and how, okay? So what are the problems that we want to solve? Why do we want to solve them? So what are the applications uh, behind a lot of these image analysis tasks? Uh, and how do we solve them? And what are the challenges involved when we, uh, when, when we develop these methodologies? And linked to when we talk about what uh, so, uh, so, sorry, how we are solving uh, these problems and the challenges linked to this, I will also talk about perspectives, okay? Okay, so let's start with what we want to solve. Um, so mathematical imaging is really about information in the sense that the common goal in mathematical imaging is to extract information from large imaging data is really a one characteristic of imaging data is large high dimensional so from large diverse again think about all the different places images appear and usually corrupted imaging data real world data is usually um, uh, imperfect uh, and suffers from noise and uh, uh, and undersampling and things like this okay and we want to extract information in an automated and robust way and this information can come in various shapes and forms. Um, it could be a motion estimation problem where we have a dynamic image sequence, like in this biological example, uh, and we want to understand, so we want to uh, quantify where things are moving in a video and with which speed. Um, another one could be um, image super resolution here in a multimodal context where we're using one high, one kind of spatially higher resolved image to super resolve another spatially lower resolved image. Um, or another one could be um, that the information we want to extract is the boundary around objects of interest, which is also called image segmentation. Okay, so again, you know, going through this a little bit more systematically, um, these are just some prototypical um, mathematical imaging tasks. So image denoising, we have a noisy image and we want to uh, attenuate the noise or, you know, or in other words, also could think of decompose um, the noisy image into the clean part and the, and the noise. Uh, so here just written down um, uh, in mathematical uh, terms. So we measure Y, which is the noisy image. We want U, which is the clean image. And in this case, I'm modeling this by additive noise. I have this uh, noise, this random, um, uh, this random component here that I want to um, attenuate, I want to get rid of, and I want to compute uh, um, an approximation to this U usually, uh, to this ground truth that I don't know. Uh, another one is image segmentation. So here, uh, and here I'm showing you this in a, in a video context, but it's the same, I mean, you've seen at the previous slide, uh, could also be for static images, of course. So you have objects of interest in an image or a video, and you want to uh, outline them. You want to delineate them. You want to find boundaries around them uh, automatically, okay? Um, and uh, that you could, uh, for instance, um, formalize in this way. So you have given you, uh, which is uh, your image or your video on, um, on, a, on a spatial domain that I call Omega. And then what you want is you want to compute. And here I'm formalizing this as a characteristic function. I want to compute the characteristic function of a subset of the spatial domain uh, that uh, should be the, sh that is the support of my object that I want to segment, right? So you could you, you could think about formalizing it like this. Uh, another one is image reconstruction from indirect measurements. I've mentioned this before, right? So uh, in a, in a lot of uh, um, times in imaging, in applications, in in medical imaging, but also. Uh, in, in biological imaging, as well as, um, for instance, material sciences, the moment I want to look inside uh, things that are um, that are uh, not opaque, I uh, 
need, uh, I'm usually not measuring an image directly, but I'm measuring some transform of this image. I'm doing some kind of tomography. And uh, that is a very, very um, uh, standard task in mathematical imaging to reconstruct an image U from measurements. Why after this image U has gone through some linear or non-linear process capital T, okay? And of course, I also have these, uh, the, um, the noise that is corrupting the data. Another one is image classification. So you have, um, you have uh, an image, for instance, that you want to classify into different components. For instance, in this case, different types of land cover from a satellite uh, image, in particular from a hyperspectral uh, image uh, that has been measured. Um, or you could think of you have a data set of images and you want to classify these images into, into different um, uh, groups, right? You want to label them uh, into uh, different categories. Okay, so these are just a few prototypical examples just to get you into, uh, into the mood. So why do we want to solve these kind of problems? Huh? Uh, what are applications that, uh, where, where images appear? And again, as you have seen in the list I've shown you at the beginning, images appear in lots of places. They appear in you know, real world application as well as uh, scientific research, as well as um, in a medical context, for instance. Yeah? So they appear uh, in a lot of places. And in particular, their automated processing and analysis is required in a lot of different uh, scenarios. Uh, and the applications I'm showing you are anecdotal. They, the, these are the applications that we have been working on in the CIA, or some of them. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm showing you those because I, I'm really excited about them. So, um, well, this one that is here uh, running through is one of my was one of my first uh, interdisciplinary collaborations when I came to Cambridge with a zoologist. So very briefly. Here, um, the zoologist uh, was interested in pied flycatcher birds and in particular started out her research with the hypothesis that the blaze, the white blaze on the forehead of these pied flycatcher birds, the size of the blaze is related to the sexual reproductiveness of those birds, right? So in a way, you might say, size matters for these birds is the hypothesis, uh, was the hypothesis. And so what we did, or what she did actually initially was that she went to the breeding cages here in Cambridge where, uh, uh, not cages, boxes actually, the breeding boxes um, uh, where these birds uh, were nesting. And uh, she took uh, photographs of um, hundreds of these birds uh, always together with a ruler to have a scale also associated, right? And so the rest, I guess, is explained by the pictures, but that was really a, quite a fun collaboration. Um, but let's again go through this a little bit more systematically, see what could be application areas and what are the problems appearing in these different application areas. So this is biomedical research and clinical support. Of course, imaging is really crucial uh, for both of these topics. Uh, and here, again, going through a few um, mathematical problems uh, that are challenging and interesting um, uh, to get engaged with and to solve. So one of them is uh, or actually the first two here that you see um, are linked to uh, this task of image reconstruction and in particular getting really the best image out of the measurements that I've been taking. Huh? The problem with um, this image reconstruction, um, uh, with this image reconstruction problem, is that usually the measurements that I'm taking are corrupted by noise, and they're usually you you have a, a, um, a, a smaller amount of measurements than the number of pixels that you want in your image, right? So you have an undersampling, you have an underdetermined problem, um, and hence you have multiple images that fit equally well the same data. So you that, therefore, and this is where mathematics comes in, you want to develop mathematical approaches that gives you the best image, whatever best means, right? 
Uh, and so this is a big area. And here we have a project running at the moment on positron emission tomography. We were trying to uh, develop mathematical techniques that really give you uh, higher definition images where the clinicians um, can uh, can see uh, um, uh, can see more for their um, um, for their onward um, um, diagnosis uh, and treatment of these patients. The other one uh, is um, in a um, spatial temporal context where you actually are not just interested in a static image but in the dynamics as well. Um, and so here again, um, being able to balance well the amount of measurements that you take per time step, right? Because taking measurements, the amount of measurements that you take, this always costs more or less time. The more measurements you take, the more time it costs, right? Or this is in, uh, this is in a magnetic resonance tomography context in particular, this time um, uh, correlation. Or in the co computer tomography context, of, for instance, when you shoot, um, uh, shoot X-rays, um, it's also either time, depending on how many angles you're covering, uh, as well as um, radiation dose, right? So you want to reduce all of this, and hence you have worse measurements, right? If you want to be able to image very fast, you have worse, worse measurements per, for each time step. And again, image reconstruction comes in, the mathematical approaches there come in very, very strongly. Uh, also in the dynamic context is estimating dynamics. We have seen this uh, briefly before, so I'll not, uh, um, 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 uh, I will not say much more about this here. Maybe just one thing. So here, um, why were these people interested in uh, estimating motion was really to understand the development, the developmental phase of um, 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 of uh, um, of an oocyte um, from a drosophila embryo. Okay, so this 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 was this collaboration here, and to do this again on a large data set, you need to be able to to do this estimation uh, automatically and uh, quantitatively. Um, another one is mitosis analysis. Let me go over this. This is. Uh, is in particular was a project where we were collaborating with cancer researchers to develop new um, uh, new drugs, um, a new chemotherapy uh, drugs for uh, for particular types of cancer. Um, and in particular, wanted to understand the, mi the mitosis and analyze the mitosis for these treated versus non-treated um, uh, cancer cells. Um, of course, segmentation is huge in clinical support, right, um, for radiologists, uh, because um, uh, to manually segment organs uh, from um, 3D imaging volumes is a huge amount of work and also requires a lot of expertise. Uh, and so to be able to learn from um, uh, from radiologists, how they do this and to capture this in terms of a mathematical algorithm that then is able to reproduce this is you is ha, has a huge, huge impact on how uh, clinicians are doing their work. And again, related to this diagnosis prognosis. Yeah, so diagnosis prognosis in the sense that we can develop algorithms that capture patterns in large data sets. Yeah, like data sets of patients with a similar type of disease. And, and that can use the patterns that they have learned to extrapolate and meaning that if you get a new patient in, they can draw connections to the data set and say, ah, actually we have seen something like this before. Look back at this patient, right? It's probably the, this and this disease, okay? Or this and this prognosis, or you should treat the patient in this and this way, okay? All right, so let me watch the time a little bit, yes. So the other one is conservation and sustainability, something we have worked on a lot. And here we are mainly looking at uh, either imaging data that has been um, collected uh, from, um, um, from satellites, uh, airplanes, or here we even have one project where we are looking at traffic uh, video data. Yeah, but the, the idea of conservation and sustainability or the kind of 
of, um, uh, area within this that we are interested in, which is remote sensing, is to really capture properties of our Earth at scale. And to have the image analysis methods at hand that can interpret and analyze this data. Yeah? And so in the context of forest conservation, we have been uh, developing methods to do um, delineation of individual trees from so-called LIDAR data, um, which is a kind of, you can imagine, 3D point cloud data that outlines objects on the ground. Um, we have been uh, developing methods for, for instance, again, in the forest context, uh, species classification from hyperspectral imaging data, uh, which is a kind of classification problem. Um, um, we have been, uh, um, and may maybe let's go there, and we have been developing methodologies that uh, can merge different types of satellite imaging data. Yeah, So, uh, for instance, uh, aerial photographs, which are just RGB photographs, which usually have a good spatial resolution, with hyperspectral imaging data, which has more than just three color channels, but like hundreds, like two, two three hundred uh, color channels. Um, but therefore a smaller spatial resolution to merge them and get kind of the best information from both. Yeah? So multimodal image fusion is a really hot topic in actually lots of applications, but here I'm showing it for remote sensing. And then another one that we actually just had, a, um, uh, had an advisory board meeting on this morning is a project where we are looking at traffic quantification and um, stratification of traffic mode. So uh, classifying uh, different types of vehicles into, yeah, so classifying different types of vehicles. Is it a bicycle, is it a car, or is it a pedestrian, and so on. Um, and this is together with health modelers who can then use that to make, um, uh, to relate this quantification um, to how active a society is, how healthy a society is in, a, in, uh, in cities around the world. Okay, um, another one that I, I, I love and I've been very passionate about is digital humanities and in particular uh, virtual art restoration. Um, and I think possibly the pictures speak for themselves, but here a few topics are uh, overpaintings, right? So the removal of overpaintings and here what we're looking at, by the way, are um, uh, pictures in illuminated manuscripts. So illuminated manuscripts, I don't know if everyone knows this uh, English word, but illuminations are these kind of gold gold uh, drawings in, in these very, very old um, uh, manuscripts. And um, so here we, we are using, for instance, scientific imaging um, uh, in particular infrared imaging, which can also look into the invisible part of the light spectrum to look underneath these overdrawings and extract the structure underneath and then use actually something similar as you have seen at the beginning in the video, namely image in painting, to propagate the colors and textures in the visible part um, into uh, along these structures that we can see from the infrared into, uh, um, into the area where we want to remove the overpainting. Okay, uh, here you see typical other application where we have damages uh, in these illuminations. We want to remove them virtually. And this uh, last one that you can see was just a fun project uh, together with a former PhD student of mine who wrote his PhD on 3D conversion. So the conversion of 2D content into 3D uh, to do this with these illuminated manuscripts. Um, the important thing here is why are we doing this at all? We are doing this in particular in this context of illuminated manuscripts, because these are usually never physically touched. They're very fragile, right? They're very kind of thin pages. They're very fragile. They would not be touched physically. So the virtual, you know, doing this virtually is somehow one way to uh, go back in time. Try, try to go back in time. Right. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I should have checked slides before. This is a little bit too quick here. Um, just a few more, uh, and I, I think I will not say uh, a lot to each of those. Material sciences is another great area of um, um, problems for mathematical imaging, in particular limited angle tomography, where you are looking at an object 
uh, from uh, various directions and you want to reconstruct the 3D picture or a, a 3D volume from, from these uh, two two-dimensional views. But in limited angle tomography, you have a whole range of angles missing. How do you make up for that? Huh? Um, computational fluid dynamics is another uh, area that we have been working on uh, where people are using magnetic resonance tomography, for instance, to visualize uh, fluid gas flow. Uh, zoology I've already talked about, or molecular biology is a project we currently have with the Laboratory of Molecular Biology here in Cambridge, um, uh, imaging molecules um, uh, with uh, so-called cryo-EM. Okay, so how do we do this? What are uh, the mathematical approaches uh, that are behind this? Maybe I should uh, look at the comments. Um... Okay, there are no questions yet, it's fine. Okay, so um, what are the mathematical approaches? Uh, and here, so let me go further. And here, uh, if you're thinking about what kind of mathematical approaches um, uh, could make sense in this, in this setting, you probably first have to, to you just briefly need to recap what we are dealing with here when we when you're talking about imaging data. And here I just want to summarize, characterize imaging data with these four Vs, where I'm stealing this uh, 4V characterization from what IBM has uh, been using for characterizing big data a couple of years ago. So the first one is volume. Imaging data is really huge. Yeah? It's high dimensional. Uh, and it's very large scale and with growing technology, of course, becomes larger and larger. Variety, okay, we have seen this. Uh, velocity, okay, this data has also been acquired at increasing speeds and so our methodologies need to be able to um, catch up with this, right? Uh, and then veracity, so we need to have methodologies that take into account that our data is usually corrupted, noisy, imperfect. Okay, and this is just saying this again, what I just said. So we need methodologies that are robust to data corruption that can handle also unseen data. A lot of, if you think back, the applications I've shown you are in areas where we don't know what the ground truth is that we are after, right? We, we, we don't know it. Um, uh, and these applications sometimes are either decision sensitive, like in the clinical context, or um, they are very important that we get them right because they are themselves informing research, scientific research. Yeah, like in material sciences, for instance, or in computational fluid dynamics, if you really want to understand um, fluid gas phenomena. Um, they need to be able to be sufficiently accurate. Again, if you think about in a clinical context, they need to reach certain accuracies. Uh, and they need to be also computationally affordable and in particular scalable, thinking about the, the fact that imaging data is large. Now, uh, having all of this in mind, what do people do huh, to solve these different tasks? So here, uh, mathematical imaging is, can be categorized in kind of two paradigms yeah, that have mostly been developed um, separately from each other, but, and this is kind of the, 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 really the kind of the first perspective glimpse, right? The exciting bits are happening at the interface between the two. This is really where the exciting work at the moment happens between what I call knowledge-driven approaches, where you, you, uh, you, you start with an imaging task, let's say segmentation, um, and you formalize the solution to this task in terms of a mathematical equation such as a nonlinear partial differential equation or um, a minimization problem like this one. And uh, a crucial component or a crucial um, uh, um, characteristic of why these mathematical models, these equations and variational models are working is um, through the assumption or based on the assumption that the information I want to extract, either an image or a segmentation or, a, or an estimated motion, can be characterized by just a few geometric components, right? Or by a small number of dictionary elements, whatever this dictionary is, and this is, comes up here in 
uh, this uh, word here, sparsity, that has a really, really huge meaning and um, and ha has a lot of consequences um, in mathematical imaging. Okay, and hence we can express them as solutions of PDEs or, or something like this. Yeah. The other one is data-driven imaging, where you uh, don't start with a model. You start, uh, instead of starting with an equation, you start with a lot of data, with a lot of examples of solutions you want your mathematical imaging approach to produce, okay? And which is your training set. Yeah? And here, of course, in particular, I have in mind uh, deep learning neural networks, which have really in the last, I would say, five years or so, has really had a huge impact in mathematical imaging and uh, has really overtaken in lots of aspects um, these knowledge-driven approaches. Um, and so at the, what is happening at the moment is that, um, that these two paradigms are being combined. And I'll tell you in a moment why. So just one example, let me just look at the watch. Yeah, I think what I'll do is, um, let me just think for a second. Um, I think I might jump over this, yeah? Uh, just, to, just to briefly tell you, a prototypical example of a knowledge-driven approach is variational modeling, yeah? which um, usually starts like this. So this is for image denoising here. You have a noisy image that you measure. You want to compute a clean image. And you do this by capturing it as a minimizer of an energy functional that on the one hand models the relationship between the, the clean image and the noisy one via, for instance, here you see an L2 squared fit, yeah? plus what is basically regularizing, smoothing, denoising the image, yeah, is your regularizer. And here, going back to this sparsity assumption, right, um, L1 type uh, of regularizers have been very, very popular um, in variational modeling. And in particular, one which is uh, called the total variation um, has been extremely important for uh, computing uh, clean images U with sharp edges. Yeah, for for um, for enhancing uh, edges in um, uh, in the denoised image, yeah, and and uh, attenuating at the same time the noise, which are these high oscillations showing up in the image intensity function. Yeah? Okay, but uh, I'll go over this uh, quickly. Here, you just see some examples. Um, doesn't matter too much. Uh, there is a connection to PDEs just briefly through. Uh, the fact that total variation um, regularization here, um, uh, if you look at the corresponding gradient flow, let me actually go one step further, in particular at the place where you can actually differentiate this, where the gradient of u is not zero, you get a nonlinear uh, diffusion equation. Yeah, And uh, so the stationary point of this uh, diffusion equation will then be a minimizer of this functional. Yeah? And here I'm just showing you the diffusion process. Okay. Um, the nice thing about knowledge-driven approaches is that there is a lot of mathematical knowledge about them. On the one hand, both on the theoretical, on the, on the analytical side, as well as on how to numerically solve them. And why is the list also how to numerically solve them so long? Because these approaches are usually highly nonlinear PDEs and non-smooth uh, optimization problems. And so they require something a little bit out of the classical uh, numerical analysis and also classical analysis box. Yeah? So on the analysis side, we encounter things like viscosity solution, geometric measure theory um, uh, problems, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so. The good thing about these approaches is there is a lot of theory, there is a lot of understanding on the, both the qualitative properties of solutions as well as um, uh, the, uh, you know, um, knowing that solutions exist and are continuously dependent on the data and so on and so forth. Um, let me jump over this as well. Um, 
and they work, right? So here I'm, I'm using them not for denoising, but for imaging painting, just linking back to the video. So this, uh, and, and showing you again, the evolution of the corresponding gradient flow, right? Uh, so you can see that this really, that this really works nicely. Right, so now uh, contrasting this to the knowledge driven approach. Now, if you go back to what I've shown you here, um, and you're thinking about what is happening here, right? So if you use total variation uh, regularization for doing this image in painting, thinking about the corresponding nonlinear diffusion equation that is doing this um, basically interpolation, solving this interpolation task, you uh, might um, suspect that if I make these uh, holes here, these um, damages in the image much larger, that it, this might look at some point, it might not look as good as it does now, right? You've also seen this in the video with the sticks. You could clearly see when you use total variation in painting uh, that something strange has happened. And this really shows you a little bit the boundaries, the limitations of what these knowledge-driven approaches, how far you can, you can go. Just based on the fact that uh, they, they are based on this assumption of a small amount of features is being, being representable for the image that is lying underneath. This is, you know, this is the property that drives them. This is also the uh, property that makes them so successful and so translatable from one um, uh, set of images to another one, right? They don't need any training, they, they just work. Now the power with recent uh, data-driven approaches like deep learning is that they can do much better if we have trained them on data, if, if we have developed these models to capture the right prior information um, that is characteristic for the type of images I want to apply them to. Yeah, And uh, so this is just, this is even, you know, this is even already quite relatively old in this, um, um, in this area. So this, this is what is super, and this is what has fascinated people um, um, for the last couple of years. Yeah, and so this is definitely extremely promising and fascinating. Of course, when you are looking at this from a mathematical point of view, that what I told you about the wonderful mathematical foundations of these knowledge-driven approaches in mathematical imaging, deep learning, at the moment suffers a really from a lack of those mathematical foundations. And, you know, this is a problem because there is no systematic way to design them. There is a safety danger that is attached to using approaches that are black box, and there is a lack of interpretation. Okay. Okay. So this is basically what we end up with when we are thinking about knowledge and data driven imaging. And I've mentioned some of these uh, properties of both um, categories uh, while going uh, through the slides before, um, where the red ones here represent the slightly negative points and the, the blue ones represent the positive ones. What really mathematical imaging currently is about is, so let me just jump over this because this is partially repeated. Mm -hmm. Partially repeating what I said, what mathematical imaging at the moment really is all about is bringing those two worlds together. Yeah? Um, combining knowledge and data-driven imaging approaches to end up with methodologies that um, inherit on the one hand, the accuracy, the performance, the ability to capture uh, uh, valuable information and in imaging data that we get from deep learning approaches. But on the other hand, to um, preserve uh, physical properties of solutions, um, to preserve in, in terms of, for instance, in uh, indirect imaging, in image reconstruction, you, you, want to, um, you want to preserve the fact that the image that you reconstructed, if you apply this 
operator capital T, let's say uh, the X-ray transform to it, you want to go back to the data that you've measured, right? You want to have this data consistency. You want to understand, you want to capture, you have this in the model that um, of the physical process that is involved in capturing the data. And you want to also have mathematical properties in terms of, for instance, stability guarantees and things like this. Okay, so this is basically, uh, I think, where the perspective, uh, what is happening at the moment. And so just to finish off, I'll go over this now. I want to give you one example of where, of, of one idea of an approach where uh, these two things are coming together. And this is collaboration with lots of uh, wonderful people. I'm not going to spell them all out now because I'm running out of time, but um, they are here and I'm going to also share the slides later. You can look at them again. Um, this is based on joint works with them. But just very briefly, the idea here, uh, or the, the hybrid model, one prototypical hybrid model that we've been developing in the last years is this idea of graph-based uh, classification. Um, on the one hand, using PDEs on graphs to do the classification, but on the other hand, using um, deep learning to extract, to basically create the space in which the graph lives, okay? Um, meaning the following. You have, and this is just an example of what these methods can do, you have a data set of X, chest X-ray scans, and your ultimate task is to classify them into uh, different, uh, different types of uh, pathologies, okay? And so, now we want to do this with a hybrid approach, and it's going to be hybrid in the sense that we take these images, we send them through a neural network, we use the neural, in, in terms of you could think of uh, using an autoencoder to, um, uh, to capture the, the main characteristics in these images. And then we use the latent space that we get from the, 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 this, uh, these neural networks to create um, a space in which we represent these images um, as points in the high dimensional space or nodes now in a graph, because I want to create a graph out of this, where uh, we, are, we are measuring similarities, distances through connecting nodes in this graph, um, and then measuring similarities um, in terms of weights that we assign to these edges that are now compute that are now depending on similarity measures, right? Uh, so like distances that we are computing in this high dimensional space that is given by the neural network. Um, and then we have a couple of these chest x-rays we have already labels for. These are the colored ones. Okay, so we know what the pathology is. And now we basically do an image in paint, uh, not, not an image in painting, but a graph in painting thing. Yeah? So we use a, a, um, the P Laplacian on the graph, okay, to do the interpolation of these labels onto the unlabeled on, uh, the, of the known pathologies onto the images, onto the chest x-rays where we don't know the pathology to get a graph that is then fully colored and we know all the pathologies. Yeah. So this is just one example of where these two approaches are coming together or, you know, one idea of how they could come together. Uh, okay, so let me finish and just say, well, um, I think mathematical imaging really offers a very powerful, rigorous toolkit um, uh, for imaging. Um, there are several applications that... Um, uh, where images appear and where really mathematics is crucial for um, progress in the medical, clinical context, for instance, but also in research. Um, and the really the big developments are at the moment happening um, in the context of AI and imaging at this high, at this interface between mm, approaches that are given by mathematical equations versus or kind of a colleague of mine recently said you know we should name this as the kind of principled way to solve image analysis problems versus the data driven way where we where we uh, use the data 
um, and very powerful um, models such as neural networks to capture uh, what we want to do um, in these neural networks from the data. And so there are many opportunities for exciting new research to advance both the theory, yeah, to really derive methodologies that have all these um, properties in the table that I've shown blue, right, that have a co really combined the best of both worlds, computations, of course, and applications of imaging approaches. Thank you very much for your attention. Flavia, uh, uh, sorry, Italia, I think you are. Okay, yeah. my audio was not activated. Sorry to all of the audience. Okay, thank you, Carolyn, for these illuminating seminars and also for, uh, uh, for giving us a beautiful landscape of the connection between uh, deep learning and mathematics, especially in, uh, in telling us the, how to say, the future, not the future, but also the immediate way that is the connection between knowledge and data-driven connection. Indeed, in a few of past seminars, we also look at uh, this uh, connection between uh, how to solve a partial differential equation uh, with the neural network uh, using the physical network form and uh, mm. uh, neural mm -hmm. the principle in order to mm -hmm. to match them because this I suppose this can be the only way in order to open the black box and to try to govern it and to give some explanation, I suppose. I don't see in the chat questions, but also thank you for giving all these references. In each slide, there was a different reference. Mm -hmm. So also very <laughs> recent reference. I gave also a look to the reference that you wrote with the other co-authors, a beautiful book. I, I must say not a paper, but mm -hmm. really a small book about mm -hmm. mathematics and deep learning. I suggest to all the audience going to read the because it is written in a very linear way so no, thank, thank you. you also for this because it was necessary and uh, just uh, a question giving back uh, to graph uh, xnet uh, the, um, the last uh, yes yeah. the last uh, so just uh, to understand uh, okay okay the pre uh, okay so in here in this is in uh, when you the initial you start uh, with the, the graph construction okay and uh, uh, you use a neural network here to for the graph construction exactly. and after exactly. so this is the data driven and after you use the knowledge driven that is the exactly. model to exactly. obtain the final graph exactly exactly Just to model, understand, exactly okay. And to link this back to the variational models that we have seen before, the okay. uh, corresponding variational model would here be that we use the graph Laplacian the as the, the regularizer, right? And then we yes, have okay. the okay. one which takes into account the labels that we know. Yeah. Okay, so through the graph Laplacian, you smooth the problem, but you make also, uh, you have also variable selection inside the, or not. Uh, when uh, you just smooth here with the graph Laplacian, am I correct? As a polarizer. Or you can also think about it like this, Italia, that we uh, interpolate. Okay. We interpolate. Use the graph Laplacian to interpolate because so it's really like the in-painting problem we have seen before. This is okay. the, the the colored points are in, in the okay. terminology of image in-painting before are the intact part of the image that we want to okay. create. Yeah, and that we want to use to inform uh, okay. the colors of the of, of the, the others. Of we the make others. inference uh, on the colors of the other. Exactly. Okay. That's okay. what the graph Laplacian is doing. Okay. Thank you. Perhaps uh, there are some comments. Uh, I don't know. Ah, there is. Uh, I know. Okay. There is people uh, that is uh, just telling. Uh, okay. That uh, is going. Uh, okay. I thank you again, uh, Carola for uh, the seminars, so for the illumination seminars, and also for the references. 
Thank you. There are no questions. So uh, I can say that I can give you the next appointments for the general uh, EAC seminars that will be the 1st of June with uh, Diego Di Bernardo. And then we will have uh, the next seminars. Uh, we still uh, for the app seminars with uh, Marco Putui from, uh, in, from Paris, but still we don't know the data. So we will announce in, on the website in the new in the new uh, in the next days thank you everybody and uh, bye bye